the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Julia Donaldson. Some of you might know me from some of the books I've written, such as The Gruffalo or What the Ladybird Heard. Well, one of the things that I really love normally about coming to the Edinburgh International Book Festival is meeting children who love to read and bringing my stories to life for them on the stage. This year, of course, none of the authors or illustrators can do that. But I am delighted that this year's online book festival is available and free to so many children in so many different places. So I hope that anyone watching has a wonderful time and that it makes you want to read lots and lots of books. Hello, budding scientists and budding book fans. I'm very, very excited today because I am introducing a super cool female scientist. She's a doctor, no less. She has many, many credits as well. She's an acclaimed science author, a public speaker, a TV personality. She's an expert in molecular biology. How cool is that? And genetics as well, which is like how you're made up and how your personality is and which bits you've got from your mum and dad. She's also an actress and a singer. I mean, what has this lady not done? Everyone put your hands together for Dr. Emily Grossman. Ooh. Hello, Emily. Hi, Connie. <laughs> Great to see you. So first of all, what do I call you? Doc, Dr. <laughs> Emily Gross, Grossman, uh, the doctor, what, what do you go by? Um, lots of people call me Dr. Emily, but you can just call me Emily. <laughs> okay, Doctor, I quite like Dr. Emily because it sounds sort of smart and intelligent. <laughs> And I like, I like smartness and I like intelligence and I like smart, intelligent females that are into science. So know, this right? is all good. <laughs> I'm in the right place, basically, aren't I? Um, and I'm very, very excited about your new book, Brain Fizzing Facts. And this is all about awesome science questions that you are answering. Yeah. And it looks super cool, I have to say. Have you got a copy with you? Yes, I do. Let's show, let's show everyone the snazzy cover. It's, uh, it's very, very eye-catching indeed. Um, so let's You've got a little start. worm in a spacesuit on the front. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's very cool indeed. And, and there's a little dog in a space helmet as well. <laughs> dog in a space helmet as well, yeah. Nice. And the nice. crown on there. 
Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got it all crammed in there, all floating about in space. Um, so let's start at the beginning, Emily. I'm I'm interested, Doc, uh, in <laughs> what got you into science. What do you love so much about science? Well, when I was growing up, my favourite mm. word was why. I was like constantly <laughs> asking questions. It was like, what does this mean? How does this work? Why does this happen? Why is the sky blue? Why do I have to eat vegetables? Why can't I pick my nose? You know, <laughs> it was like, I would not accept anything unless people could give me an explanation. And I used to drive my teachers and my parents completely bonkers. And that really <laughs> hasn't changed. And that's what I love about science because science is all about asking questions and figuring out the answers. And I love science because it helps to explain pretty much everything that goes on in the world around us. Mm. So that's why I wanted to write this book because I wanted to like pack it full of just all my favorite questions that I've always wanted to ask and I wanted to know the answers to. Um, and it was really inspired actually, um, sort of, I guess back in the day by, by my dad, because my, when I was a kid, all of these questions, most people were just like, oh my God, <laughs> can't answer this. But my dad, he <laughs> always tried to take the time to answer them. Oh, and wow. To, yeah. So um, my parents divorced when I was quite young and it was, uh, mm. I didn't see my dad so often, but um, when we did, uh, he used to, for some reason, I remember we were always going on long car journeys. I have no idea where we were going. It's probably only 10 minutes. <laughs> But, you know, when I was five, it seemed pretty long. Yeah. Um, and we would have what he called theory afternoons. Now, I was five. I did not know what a theory was. But I knew that we were going to have a fun afternoon. And he was going to, like, tell me lots of cool stuff about the world. And this really inspired me because I'd be like, can we have some theories, Dad? And um, so I remember oh. one he told me that, like, uh, basically that I used to be a monkey. Ah. <laughs> it was like a long, long time ago. We all used to be monkeys. And I was like, what? I was a monkey and he was just like well yeah like millions and millions and millions of years ago our great 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 grandparents were the same as that of a monkey and I'm just like oh my god that's amazing can I, <laughs> I have like monkey cousins can I meet them <laughs> and um and of course you can imagine you know at age five I'm like that's so interesting mm. and it wasn't until way later on in school that I learned of course what he was talking about was the theory of I'm sure you know yeah Darwinism, yeah. evolution. Nice. So was your dad a scientist? So yes, good question. Um, he's actually a doctor, a medical doctor. Right. Um, but he did also study science kind of before he became a doctor. Um, and he had this way of just making kind of stuff about the world really interesting and really fascinating and making it really simple. Um, and one of my favourite quotes actually is Albert Einstein, who said, um, if you don't, um, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And that always became my mission was to be able to understand things well enough that like my dad, I could then explain it simply to myself, but also to anybody who would listen. Yeah. <laughs> like, you need to know this. It's really cool. <laughs> I love that quote. That's a brilliant one. I'm going to I'm going to wrap that out sometimes. Quote Einstein. Very good. <laughs> so what would you say it's like to be a scientist? What kind of person can become a scientist? Anyone? That's a really good question, because one of the reasons that actually not as many people as should be, as should do, become scientists is because as children, sometimes we have this idea in our minds, right, of what it is to be a scientist. And like, we get this from society, we get this maybe from our parents, maybe from just like what we read in books. And so for a lot of people out there, if I was to ask them, or you know, let's, if I was to ask you to draw a scientist, Mm. so you're talking to me here but you know if something just popped into your mind what would you do you know what would you draw if I said draw a scientist uh scientist? you probably would draw sort of um a man and maybe a man with glasses and gray hair that looks a bit sort of zany and mad I think that that's the stereotype of the scientist in a lab coat exactly. surrounded by sort of gray things and test tubes maybe. right so we're talking a man uh we're talking what color would his skin be white probably be white he'd be old the way you described him zany hair a bit like einstein and what would this mm -hmm. old white man sounds a bit boring what would he be like in terms of his personality you know this stereotypical image of a scientist and again not like me but <laughs> what would he be like would he be kind of fun and exciting um he'd be maybe i don't know because if he's a zany scientist he, he might be a bit sort of crazy but then he could also be sort of quite boring and sort of mathematical as well maybe people you think, think he'd be like sensitive and emotional 
Mm, I don't think people think of scientists as sensitive and emotional this at all. This is my point. This is my point. So this whole ridiculous image of what it is to be a scientist, this like Einstein type image. And by the way, Einstein was not boring and, and he was not <laughs> dull. And he was very sensitive and very emotional and creative. But anyway, this, this stereotypical image is complete nonsense. And it's kind of been borne out because if you look back in a lot of the old history books and textbooks, and if you watch kind of old movies, you know, the scientist is often depicted in that way, but it's not true. And actually the qualities that it takes to be a good scientist are nothing like that at all. Mm. So scientists these days, you know, so many of the world winning um, uh, scientists who've discovered incredible things were firstly female, so it's absolutely not all men, and women of many different um, nationalities and many different uh, well, genders as well. So, you know, don't have to be just male or female either. It could be anything in between, different sexualities, different backgrounds. And those are just not represented um, in a lot of the old books we read. More and more they are. You know, kids are learning, hopefully, um, about many other scientists like Rosalind Franklin or Marie Curie, uh, Ada Lovelace, you know, amazing female scientists. But more importantly, it's not just about being kind of boring and dull and analytical. Like, yes, like I said earlier, science is definitely about understanding the world and solving problems. That's why I love it, like figuring stuff out. But science is also about being creative. It's about using your imagination. It's about dreaming. It's about trying to understand the world in a different way. It's about imagining how things could be. So that's what I love about science is that it's not just analytical it's also creative it's imaginative and it's also about people it's about wanting to help the world it's about wanting to understand the world so that we can make it a better place it's about Wait. wanting to invent things and also working together as a team like enjoying working with other people science is a real team effort and a lot of yeah. people don't really get that well, it's funny you should say that because, you know, you described yourself that the reason that you got into science was because you're so inquisitive and scientists are, they're inquisitive, always asking why. And so actually, when you think about someone that's inquisitive, that's not a boring person at all. It's that's quite cool. the opposite, actually. Exactly. It's a really fascinating person and who might have some weird quirky things that they just want to go, God, I wonder why that happened. Or I wonder what would happen if I put that in there. And that's really <laughs> what science is about. And I think also people have this idea, um, especially young people like, you know, you might have experienced this yourself growing up. I certainly did. That science is all about getting stuff right. Yeah. Science is about getting the right answer and getting a tick in your notebook. And it's not, it's absolutely not because science is actually about getting stuff wrong because it's by getting stuff wrong that we get to the answers. And there's no such thing in science as like a wrong answer or even a, a, a stupid question because it's all, that's how we get, get there. And even in terms of our brains, we learn best when we get stuff wrong and where we learn from it and then we build on that. Mm. And in fact, a lot of the best and most um, successful and most kind of um, exciting scientists out there in history get, um, made their big discoveries by making mistakes, by getting stuff yeah. wrong, by messing up their experiments, by finding something they didn't expect to find at all and just by being inquisitive. Yes, you're absolutely right. And also the thing is, is we can't take anything for granted. So if you just take things for granted, then you'll never learn new things and so that's why it's important to get things wrong and actually yes there is these laws that come about but then you know on the bigger scale there's like the bigger laws that look at things on the macro and the micro and the two if you just take those sort of i don't know newton's laws for granted on the bigger scale then you would have got it wrong so you have to always challenge things you have um, to. Don't you, to learn more exactly mm. you have to challenge stuff you have to be prepared to go okay yes but you know that could be true, but what else could be true? And as you say, Newton's laws work on a big scale, but when you get on a tiny scale, everything changes. And that's what's so interesting. And that's why I think it's also important to realize that, that so many great discoveries came, came about by mistake. So my favorite example of that is, um, you might've heard of a scientist called Alexander Fleming. Yes. So Alexander Fleming, Pendant. he wasn't actually necessarily one of the best scientists in the world, but he's, he's kind of very well known now, but yes. only because he made a big mistake. His experiment yep. went wrong, but he had the creativity and the inquisitiveness, if that's a word, <laughs> um, <laughs> to be able to kind of look at things differently. Because what he did is he was doing an experiment on bacteria. 
Now, at mm. this time, nobody knew much about bacteria. And he was growing bacteria on a little plate called a Petri dish. It's got like food for the bacteria to grow on. And he was growing them on this little dish. And he left his Petri dish on his bench in his laboratory. And he went on holiday. But the mistake that he made is that he left the dish by an open window. Now, there was food on this plate to feed the bacteria. And what happens if you leave food by an open window and you go on holiday? What it's gone. That? Yeah, it's gone off. It's gone off, exactly. Yeah. Hopefully no one's come in, climbed in and nicked it, but the food's yeah. gone off and it's probably <laughs> gone a bit mouldy. So, you know, leave out a bit of bread, it's got a bit of fluffy mould on it. And that's exactly mm. what happened to his Petri dish. So he came back from his holiday and he looked at it and he was like, oh no, you know, I've messed up my experiment. I've got it wrong. I've got mould all over my experiment. I'm going to have to throw it away. He probably thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in trouble with my boss or whatever. But actually he didn't because he looked at it again and he said what's probably one of the most important phrases in science. Now, a lot of people think that sort of the most important phrase in science is like, Eureka, I've got it, which is, uh, any, do, do you know who said Eureka? Uh, who said, I don't know. It was a Greek guy called Archimedes. Oh, and yes, of course, the Eureka bath- can. I remember exactly. now, yes, yes. He got in his bathtub and yes, supposedly the right. water flowed over the edges and he was like, Eureka, I've got it. I understand about displacement and yes. velocity and density. Um, but supposedly that's, you know, a really important phrase. Like, I get it, I understand. But actually, arguably the most important phrase is actually what Fleming probably said when he looked at his messed up experiment and went, oh, that's funny. Because he noticed something strange and rather than throw it away, he said, hmm, I'm gonna see what's going on here. Because he noticed that around the fluffy bits of mold on the plate, the bacteria had died. Now he had the sort of presence of mind and the imagination to go, that's very interesting. Because at that time they didn't know anything that could kill bacteria. So he went away and he did experiments on the mold and he isolated from the mold a chemical that he went on to call, any idea? Penicillin. That's right. It wasn't actually him who named it penicillin, but him and his colleagues, they called it penicillin. It was the first antibiotic and it went on to save millions of lives by killing bacteria from pe- uh, on people in hospitals who were dying from bacterial infections. So anybody mm-hmm. who's taken antibiotics today, which I'm sure most people have, to cure a throat infection or something else. We owe that to the mistake that Alexander Fleming made in his experiment and to his curiosity and his presence of mind and his kind of ability, willingness to sort of go on a different route to figure out what it was. So- Hooray for mistakes. I know, exactly. (laughs) So tell me about some of your favorite facts from the Brain Fizzing Facts book, because I'm dying to know some. There's some great ones in there. (laughs) Yeah, so this book came about because, like I said, I've always been fascinated in knowing stuff about the world and explaining it to people, but also because I worked for a while, um, I did six series of a show called Duck Quacks Don't Echo, which some kids might have seen, which was a show on yeah. Sky um, hosted by Lee Mack. And we did lots of weird facts and we, I was one of the verifiers, so we had to kind of explain the facts. And I noticed that some of them were just like, oh my God, I I want everyone in the world to know this. And particularly, I think, you know, when I was a kid, I would have really wanted to know this fact. So I started off, when I wrote the book, I started off with a few of those. And then I kind of started researching other facts that I thought were really exciting and interesting as well. So um, people often ask me, like, you have to um, sort of, what what sorts of facts are in the book and what are your favorite facts? So I wanted to present, uh, well, to, to tell you about one of my favorite facts, which was actually one that I got from the Duck Quacks Don't Echo show um, years ago. Um, and I'll, I'll show you where it is in the book, just so you can see sort of what the illustrations and stuff look like. But um, let me start actually by asking you, are you ticklish? Yes, I am. Okay. How do you, how do you find being tickled? Oh, I find it really annoying because- I don't- even though you want it to stop you're laughing so it sort of makes the tickler feel like you're enjoying it and it makes no sense it would be like if you were being punched in the face and you involuntary said I want you to punch me more when really you think stop it stop it it's so annoying exactly right so that's the thing that most people find that when we're tickled our face just involuntarily makes like smile noises and well smile 
positions and laugh noises. Yeah, laughing. Like, don't yeah. want to be smiling or laughing. And it, yeah. actually, a lot of people find it really, as you said, annoying, or sometimes it even hurts. So you might be interested to know that did you know that you can block a tickle? <gasps> wow, thank you, thank you. This is the best news ever. How do I block a tickle? So the way that this book is laid out is that what I always do is I, I give everything as a sort of multiple choice question because the whole point is, is that I love the idea that, you know, when people are reading this book, and it's not just kids growing up to read this book as well, um, I've been told lots of adults have it in their toilet because they like to read it when they're on the loo. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so I always lay it out with like four different answers. So it's a kind of multiple choice. But the idea is that um, I want to get people thinking about what answer could it be? So like when you read the book, it's like, oh, could it be this one or could it be that one? And the idea is to like have a guess. And then in the explanation, I explain which of the answers is true. And often I also talk about why the others aren't quite true or why they are right. true, but not quite. So have a go i'll show you the four for this one so how do you block mm -hmm. so a is i don't know if you can see that there a is tense your muscles b is think right. about something different c is oh i'm not gonna tell you the other two actually because i don't want to give it away so I'm ah, okay now, because for this one i don't want to give it away so okay. of the ones i've said and also of whatever you might think can you think of anything that you could do to block a tickle that you might be able to do um thinking about something else might be a good one because you divert your thought away from nice. tickling exactly so that might be about distracting yourself so you're thinking about something else and actually that does work to a certain extent so if you try and distract yourself when someone's tickling you it does work a little bit distract your brain sort of mind over matter but there's actually something you can do that's a lot better and that's a lot more effective shall i say in blocking mm. So the other one that I gave you was tense your muscles. So oh, again, yes. that could work a little bit if you sort of tense your muscles, someone's tickling you, but again, not very, very well. One of the answers I've given here is hold your breath and stick out your tongue. That was a bit of a silly one. <laughs> That's not going <laughs> to do anything very much. Often I give a silly answer too. Um, exactly. But there is something that will be very effective for most people. And I'll give you a clue. Have you ever tried to tickle yourself? Give it a go. No, I haven't. Yeah, it's not working the it doesn't same. Work, right? No. So we can't tickle ourselves. And the reason for that is being ticklish relies on the element of surprise. So it makes sense that sort of back in caveman days, it was quite useful if we'd feel ticklish when something surprising was on our skin, because it was likely to be some kind of creature that might bite us or sting us or scratch us. And if we felt ticklish, we'd sort of go oh, and we'd flick it away and get rid of it. And that would be good because in those days there weren't any doctors or hospitals. So it was good to kind of stop things scratching or biting you. <clears throat> but imagine what would happen if we felt ticklish every time anything touched our skin, including our own hands on our own skin. Imagine what would happen every time you put on your shoes and socks. That right? would be cool. <laughs> It'd be ridiculous. You'd just fall about laughing. So our clever brain has evolved, that means changed over time, to be able to block the tickly feelings when it's our own hands on our own skin. And what it does is it makes a very quick prediction about how our hands are going to feel on our skin, exactly what it's gonna feel like, just before our hand touches our skin. And then that prediction allows us to block the tickle response in that particular area. So, how can we use this information? Because this is what I love about science. You find out something and then you're like, okay, how can I use this to figure out the answer to what I really want to know, which is how to block someone else tickling me. So if we use this information, we say, okay, I can't tickle myself because I can predict how it's gonna feel. So if someone else's hands were coming towards me or if someone else, if my hands were coming towards you, Connie, you can sort of do this on the screen. Uh. <laughs> what do you think you could do to my hands just before I, tickle you to block how the tickly feelings are going to feel for you as if my hands were your hands is there I any way? hold your hands yes exactly if you put your hands on top of my hands as i start to tickle you literally hold my fingers so you still let me tickle you because you probably can't stop me if i <laughs> but if you put your hands on my hands it won't actually tickle it will literally oh. tickle as if your own hands are doing this. So we can't try it, obviously, because we're on Zoom, but um, <laughs> try it with, a, with someone else. I'll try it later with on my kids. kids. Yeah, exactly. 
Yay. So like a tickle. Brilliant. I love that. That's <laughs> so clever. Great. So, um, and, yeah. No, go on. No, no, go on. No, I was going to say, so is that your favourite fact from the, from the book? So that's definitely my favourite fact that came from one of the original Ducks Quacks Don't Echo. Um, no one can yep. say that. No one calls it Ducks Don't <laughs> Quack. It's like Duck Quacks Don't Echo. And by the way, they do. <laughs> that was a <laughs> the point of that title was that it was wrong because <laughs> some of the oh facts, yeah. I see okay um, interesting but, so that was one of the one of the facts that I learned longest ago because I learned it on the show about six years ago but one of my okay. other favorite facts in in brain fizzing um, uh, I I had to query myself but but you can go it might be linked to what your favorite fact is I was reading about your book and there were lots of questions and I want to know the answer to all of them. Why is your elbow called your funny bone? How can you escape the grip of a crocodile's jaw? And very, very importantly, I want to know what animal can breathe through its bottom? Are you allowed <laughs> to tell me this? I was like, I was trying to wrap my brains out and think what animal can breathe through its bottom? Okay. It has a nose on its bum. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, hold on, let me find that one. <laughs> funnily enough that is quite a popular question in this book um, funny so, that I know my kids would be intrigued so here's here's the here's that that fact so what animal can breathe through its bottom mm -hmm. so I give uh, four options for this one as well so we've okay. got a turtle a frog a dolphin or a puffer fish Ooh, interesting so I think what I'll do with this one because it's quite mm -hmm. a, an interesting sort of um what's so a sort of dive if you'll forgive the pun into the world of creatures that have strange breathing habits because all four of these creatures actually do breathe a bit strangely so if I start with let's say a puffer fish so you probably know this Connie how, how do most fish breathe puffer fish mm. any other type of fish they have gills exactly so they they do have a mouth but they don't breathe because breathing actually strictly means taking in air through their mouth into their lungs mm -hmm. they don't because there is no air, there's only water. So the water passes over these flaps of skin um, on the sides of their heads called gills. And as the water passes over the flaps, the oxygen, which is what's needed from the breathing in, is absorbed through the gill into, directly into their blood. And so that's how they get their oxygen. So that's how they sort of breathe. It's not strictly speaking breathing. So it's not fish. They don't need their bottoms. So um, another one on the list was, uh, let's say, a dolphin. So dolphins also live underwater. They don't have gills like a fish. So how do they breathe? Could it be their bottom? Any ideas how dolphins breathe? Or so they come breathe? up for air. They do, but they don't suck in their air through their mouth like humans do. What do they suck in their air through? Their nose. <laughs> no, they don't. They've got a hole on the back of their body called a blow. Oh hole. yes, on their head. Yeah. Is it on the back of their head? It's, sometimes it's on their head, sometimes it's on their back. Right. And that hole, it's called a blowhole because they literally blow through it and they suck mm. through it. So actually they don't use their mouth for breathing at all. They come up to the surface and they use this little hole on their head just to sort of suck in, little picture of the dolphin there, <laughs> to suck in air. And then the air goes into their lungs, they take in the oxygen and then they scoosh out the air they don't need anymore. I like that it word. Out, it come, I think I made that up. It comes out with sort of a bit of excess water that they've also taken in and they sort of squirt it out like a sort of like turbocharged snot, <laughs> which is why if no. you ever see uh, dolphins or whales on a nature documentary or if you've ever been out to see them in the wild, you'll see that they kind of shoot up this kind of stream of basically snot and it comes out super fast. I wouldn't go near it. It comes out at 160 kilometers an hour, <laughs> turbocharged snot. Um, but they don't like need... whales. They do exactly that. whales do the same, which is why it's so rewarding to go dolphin or whale spotting because they go underwater, but eventually they do have to surface to suck in more air. Now dolphins mm. can stay under for about eight to ten minutes, but the sperm whale can stay underwater for up to ninety minutes before it wow. has to rise, suck in more air, and scoosh out the rest. Compared to the longest human, the longest that a human's been able to stay underwater before coming up to breathe is about twenty-four minutes. So whales are pretty, pretty good at holding their breath underwater. Wow. So it's not dolphins or whales. They don't use their bottom. Um, so another one was a frog. Any idea how frogs breathe? See if we've mm. got little frogs here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cute. Cute. Um, do they have, they have nostrils, don't they? 
nostrils. They do have nostrils and mouths. So they do actually breathe through their mouth into their lungs when they're on land. But frogs are really interesting because they can also breathe when they're in water. Ah. And they breathe when they're in water by using their skin. So their whole skin acts like one big gill, like a fish. And they absorb oxygen from the, the water that's on their skin, which is why they're often called slimy because their skin has to remain damp in order to absorb the oxygen. Again, no bottoms, which <laughs> leaves us with a turtle. Ah. So a turtle. So turtles are very, very interesting because there is a type of turtle called the Australian Fitzroy River Turtle. Now, the Australian Fitzroy River Turtle um, lives in very, very cold areas. And during the winter, they actually hibernate underneath the surface of a lake, a frozen lake, because right. it's actually warmer in the water under a frozen lake because of the layer of ice that traps the heat than it is on the land. So they hibernate underwater for up to five months at a time. <clears throat> so how do they get their oxygen? They don't have gills like a fish. They can't take it in through their skin because they've got a big hard shell. On their yeah. pack. They don't have a blowhole. No. So they've only got one option left, their bottom. Mm. They literally suck in water <clears throat> through their bottom hole. It's actually called a cloaca. Okay. And it's the same hole that they we and poo through and have babies through. And they suck in water into that hole in their bottom. And then they absorb oxygen through the skin inside that hole, just like a fish does with its gills and a frog does with its skin. And they absorb the oxygen and then they scoosh the water back out. And scoosh. they do this, scoosh, it's my favorite word. They do this kind of in out, in out, scooshy thing 60 times a minute. So basically every second. So during that five months where they're hibernating, they get all the oxygen that they need in order to survive by sucking water in, in and out into their bottom hole. Ah, nice. Um, not that yeah. attractive. But, no. But... So again, it's not strictly speaking breathing, but it's how they get their oxygen. So yeah, that's uh -huh. definitely one of my favorite facts. <laughs> Fascinating. Animals can be so weird, can't they? Animals can be super weird, but I really love writing about animals and finding out facts about animals because animals aren't just beautiful to look at. They're not just, you know, something that we should be kind of in awe of and find out, mm. about. but actually they're hugely important to the planet and to us as humans. And animals are all sort of linked together in what we call ecosystems. Mm. A lot of people don't realize how much we actually depend on animals as humans and how much animals all depend on each other, which is why we really need to look after them and make sure that they stay all in balance with each other. Do you know which is the most important animal on earth? Oh, that's a good question. I have no idea. Certainly to humans, but also generally, the most important animal on earth is actually a bee. Ah, oh, yes. Bee. And that's for, do you know why? Why, why, might, why that might the be? The pollination, so that they can keep exactly. all our lovely flora and fauna procreating and exactly. lovely vegetation and greenery, which actually brings me on nicely. Am I right in thinking that your next book has got a real eco skew to it and a yeah. saving the planet theme. That's just brilliant. Yeah. So my next book's coming out um, in April 2021, I believe, around that time. Um, so spring 2021. And yeah, it's called World Whizzing Facts. So more on the theme, very similar mm -hmm. structure and format, you know, facts and multiple choice questions and fun explanations. Um, but these questions, most of them about the earth, are about the earth and about yeah. our planet and about creatures that live on our planet, but also what yeah. we as humans are doing to our planet. Yeah. And we're having on our planet, explaining about loss of wildlife, about climate change, how it all works, what we know about it. And also more importantly, talking about why we need to really make changes on the planet, but what we can do and what everyone can do, no matter how small you are, to make a real difference to the planet. Yes. Because I mentioned, yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say exactly what I think you were going to say about biodiversity and how yeah. everything depends on everything. Exactly. And even, you know, we wouldn't be alive without fungus, for instance, that breaks everything down. The unsung Absolutely. heroes of, you know, the plant world. And then 
all different animals depend on each other for the feeding chain and then we need vegetation for the animals to eat and it's all so like you said interdependent and i think you're right i think often people forget the bigger picture so they think oh this little thing won't count and that little thing won't count but all the little things together make big things and now our planet is on a path to uh destruction if we're not careful yeah exactly that's why i mentioned the bees because you know they may seem small and tiny but and and you know bees are on the list of species that are actually threatened with extinction as are a lot of other types of insects um but the the point is about these small insects is that they pollinate our crops as you said and our crops are what feed us so you know about 80 percent of crops are pollinate or 80 percent of pollination is carried out by bees so you know if we lose them we're going to lose a lot of the ability to grow food and that's really really important and um some people say that ecosystems are sort of like a giant game of jenga so it's like you know if you pulled out pull out just a couple of pieces from right down the bottom like the whole thing can come sort of tumbling down and similarly with coral reefs you know where our coral reefs are in huge danger at the moment in, in the next sort of 20 to 30 years yeah all of them being wiped out and they're not just beautiful to look at if you go diving, but around a billion people across the globe depend on coral reefs for their food, for protection from storms. They also feed millions of other creatures further up the food chain. So you, we really need to think about what we're doing to the planet. But the good thing is there's lots of things that we can do to help. Um, and one of my favourite examples of this is actually something that happened about 100 years ago, but lots of similar things are hope stories, stories of hope are happening today. But it started with actually... Uh, a story of not hope, you know, damage that uh, humans were doing to the planet, which was that um, in Yellowstone Park, a big uh, national park in the States, um, they were trying to take some of the land and use it for grazing cattle, which is happening more and more across the globe, as I'm sure you know. We've now got 1.5 million um, uh, cows on the planet, and they're burping out huge amounts of methane, which is going into the atmosphere, and, and it's a greenhouse gas. It's causing a fluffy blanket around the earth to get thicker and the atmosphere to heat up but anyway they were wanting to clear land to, to um, graze animals cattle and um, what happened though is that lots of wolves came in and started sort of causing havoc and trying to chase the cattle and attack the cattle so hunters came in and they were like okay easy let's just kill all the wolves so they just came and shot all the wolves but what then happened is in the rest of the park which at that point was still sort of wild First of all, the elk, which are like big deer, that the wolves usually ate, they then started to go up in numbers because suddenly they were like, well, hey, no predators, you know, we yeah. flourish. So that's all well and good. But then the trees and the plants that the wolves, um, sorry, not the wolves, that the elk used to eat, they then went down in numbers. So we, the, the park lost loads of aspen trees and small plants. So the vegetation massively declined. Not only that, but the elk then started to eat away at all the vegetation on the sides of the rivers. And that meant that the riverbanks started to erode. Now, when the riverbanks eroded, that meant that the trees on the banks of the river sort of fell in or kind of went backwards a bit, which meant that there was less shade hanging over the river, which meant that the, the temperature of the water went up, which changed the numbers and the amounts of fish in the water. So there are big changes in the fish. And then also, Normally there were songbirds that used to, to make their nests on the vegetation on the banks of the river. And with that being eaten by the elk, the songbirds have nowhere to live. So they all flew away to find other homes. And then also finally, the beavers in the park used to feed off the um, vegetation on the side of the river. Uh, no, sorry, not feed off. They used to the, the cat, um, uh, kind of collect it to make their dams. They used to use the mm. roots and the bottoms of willow trees to make their dams across the river to hold the river back so they could um, build their homes. So they then ran out of stuff to make their dams with, and then the river broke through, and then their homes all got flooded. So just by removing the walls by human action, there was a knock-on effect on the elk, the vegetation, the fish, the songbirds, and the beavers. And as soon as, luckily, as soon as people realized what was going on, all they had to do was reintroduce the wolves and eventually over time the whole ecosystem the whole group of organisms who all interacted with each other it all started to flourish again and yeah part the, eventually went back to its natural state the balance was restored and that's the thing it's a really good sort of microcosm story for the bigger picture on earth 
in that we need to make sure that the balance is always kept right for Earth to continue to prevail and life on Earth uh, to continue to prevail. Oh, wow, I'm so excited yeah. about this next book. Um, so what are, the, what are your favourite facts from this book then? Well, I've got a couple more favourites that are to do with animals, which are sort of also related to how important creatures are. Um, so, you know, we talked about bees being important, but mm. um, we often underestimate the importance also of big creatures. So, for example, I've got a fact on, um, on poo. There's a lot of facts on poo. And in one mm. of those, I go into talking about um, whale poo. And did you know that whale poo actually saves the world? <laughs> Now, that might sound a bit ridiculous, but whales actually poo out about 200 litres of liquid poo every day. That's a huge amount of poo. <laughs> well, you know, disgusting as it might sound, it's actually crucial to our planet because whales only poo when they're at the surface of the water. Because when they dive and they go deep below, they have to shut down their sort of non-essential body activities such as poo. Um, but when they dive, they go and they eat um, like small ocean creatures from very deep below and they bring up those creatures in their bellies when they come to the surface and then when they poo they poo out the nutrients from those deep ocean creatures so what they're actually doing is through their pooing they're bringing up um, nutrients like nitrates and phosphates to the surface of the oceans and those nutrients and then are then fed off by tiny green plants called uh, plankton that live on the surface of the water something called algae and without those, the algae wouldn't be able to grow. And then other sea creatures feed off those algae. And so basically that then leads to the whole ecosystem being able to thrive. So whales are sometimes called ecosystem engineers. And why that's so important is not just because of the thriving of the ecosystem, but also because plankton, these little algae, they actually trap a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And you probably know that you know, we really need our stores of carbon, um, mm. our trees, which is the soil, which is oceans. And in fact, the algae and the, the, the small plants in the oceans, just in the Southern Ocean, in the Antarct in Antarctic Ocean, they trap more carbon from the atmosphere than the whole of the Amazon rainforest. And the reason that we need to be trapping carbon dioxide in the form of carbon from the atmosphere is, as I said, because of human activity, our blanket of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, that is actually very important to us. It's like, acts like a blanket around the planet. It keeps us nice and warm at night. Mm. Without it, we would all die because actually it would be far too cold at night. We'd all freeze to death because this blanket traps the heat kind of coming off the surface of the earth as a result of it being heated by the sun. So we need this fluffy blanket, but this fluffy blanket is actually getting a little bit too thick. In fact, a lot too thick. So we really need these, the whale poo to produce enough nutrients for the plankton to grow so that the plankton can take in some of this extra carbon dioxide through a process called photosynthesis and it gets trapped within the, the actual bodies of these uh, plants. Um, so that, that sort of brings me on actually because you asked me about sort of some specific facts. That was just one of my yeah. throwaway sort of um, facts within a fact in the book. That's a good my, poo fact. Yeah, that was a good poo fact. But I, I hear you've got a good wee fact as well. I do, I do. And um, oh, I was gonna I was gonna show you, but actually this isn't book two, but book two's only just come out of my head. So book two ah. is currently being illustrated and it's gonna be in a book form um, in the spring, like I said. But um, yeah, one of my favorite actual multiple choice facts from that is, did you know that we make better decisions when we're in one of these states? So do you think, and it will relate back to what I was just talking about in a minute, because a lot of these facts in, in World Wizarding Facts book actually do relate to our planet and what we're doing to our planet, and most importantly, how we can help. Um, but yeah, did you, make, did you know we make better decisions either when you're hungry? Do you think you make better decisions when you're hungry? When you're tired? When you need a wee? Or when you've been stung by a wasp? <laughs> No. <laughs> so definitely I think not when I'm hungry. Away. <laughs> definitely not when I'm tired or hungry. I make the worst decisions. Yeah, me I too. Food to thrive, and I need energy to thrive. <laughs> um, and I think you'd be too angry when you're stung by a wasp. 
which leaves needing a we. Exactly. Um, so it's actually true that we make better decisions when we need a we. So bizarrely, scientists actually did an experiment. You know, scientists do some of the most weird and interesting jobs. There are scientists who spent their career studying, needing a we and making decisions. Mm -hmm. True fact. And these scientists, they took a load of volunteers and they were like, they asked them a question and they studied whether or not they made a good or a bad decision. Now, first of all, we have to define what we mean by a good or bad decision. So let's say I offered you a bar of chocolate and I was like, do you want this yes, bar please. of chocolate? Yeah, I can see yes, it. Please. <laughs> or do you want to wait till tomorrow and I'll give you 10 pounds? Then I can buy lots more bars of chocolate. <laughs> Exactly. So that's clearly the better decision. It's got a good long term outcome. And that hopefully you won't buy more bars of chocolate, you'll buy something more useful or sort of one bar of chocolate and something and then useful. useful things, exactly. <laughs> um, healthy things. But it's obviously a better decision to wait. But some of us will be just be so kind of overpowered by our instincts and our sort of uh, emotional drive that we'll go, ah, I want to have the chocolate. I don't care if I'll get more tomorrow. And what these scientists found is that when people needed a we, they were better able to control their sort of emotional urges and to make a better long-term decision with a good outcome in the future, rather than just go with what they wanted in the moment. And what they thought was going on was that when people need a we, they reckon that there's a part of our brain that's responsible for controlling that physical urge to just let it all out and we on the floor. <laughs> and when you're controlling that physical urge to we, which most of us are pretty good at, we're also better automatically at controlling our emotional urges as well, because it's the same part of the brain that controls the desire to have the chocolate as the desire to just we on the floor. So the idea is that when we're needing a we, we're better able to control our urges and we're better able to make good long term decisions. And in fact, some world leaders um, like the former Prime Minister David Cameron have actually admitted to using this we holding technique when they go into their negotiation meetings so they make better decisions for the country with a better long-term help. Ah, as so, long as he never wet himself. Well, this is what I was worried about. I was like, you know, when I wrote about this back in my book, I was like, look, don't hold it on too, too much. But I do recommend that if you're going for shopping, for example, and you're going out and, and you want to like go out and buy some new clothes or some new toys or something, I'm thinking, well, actually, don't hold it in so much you're going to wee on the floor, but it's probably a good idea to hold your wee in just a little bit so that you resist that urge to just buy another thing that you don't really need, like, I don't know, another trampoline for the garden or something. <laughs> They're like, right. mom, I don't want that. And it's like, you don't <laughs> need that. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and let me ask you, because, you know, this sort of moves on to something actually quite mm. important, is that, you know, why is it, do you think, that it's actually a good idea to make better decisions, better long-term decisions these days when we go out shopping so that we don't just buy, you know, another top or another pair of trainers or another computer game or gadget or another something for the garden if we don't actually need it. If you need it, fair enough. But if you could do without it or you could really be better off buying it from a charity shop or maybe borrowing one from a friend or, or just not having it do you really need it that much first really? of all do you really need it takes up space yeah. costs money yeah but you'll money. only need it will only become landfill in when you've got bored of it in two seconds so the waste <laughs> exactly will go into a landfill even if you recycle plastic waste these days a lot of that still just ends up in the sea and it ends up poisoning and damaging sea creatures. But aside from the problems with waste and the problems with what happens to plastic, for example, there's another really important reason why we really need to start cutting down on how much stuff that we buy, how much new stuff, because it's not just about what we do with it when, it's, when we're finished with it. It's about the process of buying it itself means that those things need to be made. And those things are usually made in factories. Often those factories are far away in other countries and making stuff requires energy. And yes, exactly. Making and stuff, energy. transporting stuff, transporting the raw materials to the factory to make the stuff, powering the factory. Like everything is we've just overcomplicated everything. And why? Because people are fed this idea that they need all this stuff that actually they get bored of in two seconds and becomes exactly. a waste anyway. You need very little to be happy. And actually 
the the thought that you need those stuff actually makes you unhappy because you want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing after you're done with the iPhone 1000, you're the 2000, 3000, 4000, exactly. when does it end? It's really bad news. Exactly, but the most important thing here is where does that energy come from? That energy that's required to make the stuff comes from burning fossil fuels. And what happens when we burn fossil fuels is that all the, the, the basically fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, they are made from dead plants and sea creatures that have been dead for millions and millions of years and trapped inside of it is lots of carbon. And when we burn the fossil fuel, not only does it release energy, which of course we need, there's other ways to get energy though, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you know, like renewable energy, wind and solar power. But when we use fossil fuels instead, all of that carbon that's been trapped for millions of years gets turned into carbon dioxide, it gets released into the atmosphere and it thickens our fluffy blanket along and with- And once the again, we're spoiling the balance. Exactly. And that balance means that the fluffy blanket is getting thicker. And by the way, I mentioned cows. There's actually 1.5 billion cows on the planet, not million, I got that wrong. It's even more. Um, so the methane from the cows, the carbon dioxide from the factories, the carbon dioxide from the burning of trees when we cut down our forests, from the plowing up of our fields, all of that carbon and carbon Transportation. Dioxide, transportation, aeroplanes, mm-hmm. cars, all of that carbon dioxide ends up in the atmosphere. It makes our blanket thicker. It makes us a bit warmer. And the problem is, as we get warmer, huge, huge problems are going on on the planet. So it's causing our planet to heat up. In fact, it may not sound like it's gone up by much. It may not feel like it's gone up by much, our global global sort of temperatures. But actually, the amount of extra heat that is now being trapped in our atmosphere as a result of our fluffy blanket getting thicker is actually the equivalent to five atomic bombs going off in our atmosphere every second of every day. That's all the extra heat energy. And that heat energy, first of all, makes it more likely that we're gonna get heat waves, which can lead to droughts, and in parts of the world, water shortages, which might actually start happening in this part, this area of the world soon as well, if we don't make, if we don't stop. But also it leads to more rainfall because when the atmosphere is hotter, the, the oceans get warmer, more water evaporates from the oceans, and that causes more clouds. And in fact, I'm just going to come to um, something, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna sort of, I want to actually demonstrate how this happens. But before I do that, I wanna just finish that, that process by saying when we get more clouds, we get more rain. And as, so as a result of the heat in the atmosphere, we get more water vapor in the air, we get more clouds, we get um, bigger and heavier clouds. And that means in some areas of the world that are already wet, they get wetter we get more rain, we get more floods, and that damages creatures, it damages crops, it damages our food, it floods homes. So dry areas get hotter and drier, wet areas get wetter, and that's why we're seeing more storms, more extreme weather events in this country and across the world. And of course that extra heat also that heats up the oceans causes ice to melt in the oceans. And that ice melting, you know, we've all seen pictures of polar bears who don't have Um, the ice to stand on to catch seals so they're all starving it's not just polar bears but there's many other creatures that are being impacted by warmer temperatures in hot areas or ice melting in cold areas and when the ice melts if it's ice that's been on the land it runs off into the sea and that causes seas to rise plus when warm when seas get warm because of the extra heat in the atmosphere they expand water expands Um, when it gets hot. So the seas rise, they take up more space. And over the coming years, if we don't make radical changes very quickly and start radically stopping burning fossil fuels and stopping cutting down forests and plowing up the the soil and do more sustainable farming, then we're gonna see the sea level rising and we're gonna see hundreds of millions of people's homes getting flooded across the globe and people having to move, maybe crops getting flooded so we can't feed ourselves enough. So there is time to make a big difference, but we do need to think about what we're doing to our planet. And, you know, that's one of the things that we can do if we make better decisions when we go out shopping and we hold on to our we, maybe, or just make better decisions because we're more informed and educated, then maybe we don't buy as much new stuff. Maybe yes, we don't, we don't need it. And I then hate we're the planet as I well. I hate it. Consumerism is just, ugh. Anyway, um, that is so fascinating. You've been absolutely fascinating, Emily. I'm so excited to delve into both books, 
So the current one, and when is the next one coming out? So the next one's coming out in spring 2021. Um, okay. And can I leave you with just, I, I talked yes. about cows. I know we're running low on time, but in case you were wanting to, to wrap up in a minute, I, I really wanted to do an actual little demonstration of something. Oh, yes. Yes, please. Um, Go for I'm, it. I'm, I'm sort of still in lockdown, um, but I managed to get some of my science experiments sent up to, because I'm not actually at my home in London. I'm um, staying with my partner in Devon. Um, but right. I managed to get some of my um, science experiments sent up from London because I really wanted to show you one of my favourites. So Yay. this isn't in any of the books. This is only something that you you can see um, when I, because I do a lot of work in schools. I go to schools and I and I do live shows based on um, one and both, well, on both of the books. And excuse me, this is one of my favourite experiments that I do when I come to schools. So I just thought I'd love to, I'd love to show it to you. Um, and it's really linked to the last fact I was talking about because I was talking about as, as um, about rain and about wet areas getting wetter because of climate change. And I mentioned forming clouds. So I talked about how clouds form and I talked about how when water in the oceans warms from the heat in the atmosphere, the water evaporates and it turns into invisible water vapor above the oceans. And that invisible water vapor then rises up. And as it rises, it expands and it cools and it, the, as it cools, it loses a bit of energy and those invisible molecules of water vapor come back together to form tiny little droplets of water. And that's where you see a cloud. It's kind of like mist, tiny droplets of water. So what that means is, is that in theory, if we could make invisible water vapor get cold, we could form a cloud. Now, water vapor is in the air all around us all the time. There's lots of it above the oceans because it's evaporated from there, but there's lots of it around us all the time. There is water vapor in the air right now in this room and where you are now. So if I could make the invisible water vapor in this room get a little bit cold, I could potentially make something quite magic happen. Now, I can't make the, the whole air in this room get cold, but what I can do is I can make the air in this empty plastic bottle, which by the way, I use and reuse and reuse I'm not, I don't buy new ones of these. It's a really good idea not to buy uh, plastic unless you can possibly help it. And make sure you reuse, it, you reuse it as you do. But this is my one plastic bottle that I use for this experiment. Um, so in this plastic bottle, there is just air and all the, all the gases that are in air, including invisible water vapor. So the way that I'm gonna try and make the air in this bottle get a bit cold is I'm going to use a bicycle pump. So all of the experiments that I do uh, when I go to schools, are all stuff that you can do at home. So in theory, you can actually do this at home. So it's a little bit tricky. So I'm going to show you um, how I've managed to make it work. So what you do is you take an empty plastic bottle and you find a cork. And I've pushed a hole in the cork using a screwdriver so that there's a little hole goes all the way through. And I've attached it to the end of a nozzle that goes on the end of a bicycle pump. And I'm going to pop it in there. Now, when you pump air into a tire or a bicycle tire, for example, or a car tire, you might have noticed that the tire gets hard, like blowing up a balloon. It gets hard. It gets sort of quite solid. That's the pressure building up. But you might also have noticed it's very subtle. So you might not have. But there's a slight change in temperature. It actually gets a little bit warm because the energy inside the air, or the energy of the air inside the tire is actually increasing because of the pressure. So, and also because of the work you're doing on it to pump the air into it. So it gets a little bit warm. And when it gets warm, that means that as the temperature increases, something magic can happen. The important thing here is that when invisible water vapor gets warm, then we get even more water vapor. But if we then let the air out of the tire, or in this case, the bottle, and the air rushes out, the pressure will suddenly drop. And when the pressure drops, the air will get a little bit... Colder. Colder, exactly. That's how science works. If it gets hotter when you increase the pressure, when you drop the pressure, it's gonna get colder. So if I can do that in this bottle and I can get the, the air to rush out, so I pump it up, push some air in, make the air get hot, let, let it rush out quickly and allow it to suddenly get cold, there's a, hopefully, if this goes well, we should see something magic happen. So I've got my bicycle pump. You saw my bicycle pump here. I'm going to attach it 
to the nozzle on the end of the bottle. So usually I get a child to help me do this. So I'm gonna try and do it one handed, which isn't that easy, but bear with me. So you can see the bottle there. You'll be able to see it better in a minute because I have to hold it. So I'm gonna hold on to it really tight so the nozzle doesn't, fall, doesn't squish, fly out. And I'm gonna pump air into it like this. And I can already feel it against my chest. I can already feel it getting really stiff and really hard. And I can feel it getting a little bit warm as the air fills up the plastic bottle. So I'm gonna pump it in a couple more times, really hard. So it's now got really hard and really stiff. I don't want the end to fly off. I'm gonna give it one more pump and then keep an eye on the bottle. Three, two, one. Yeah, loud in a bottle. Is it loud in a bottle. Brilliant. That was fantastic, Dr. Emily Grossman. That is ace. What a great, great session. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And I'm very, very excited about both books. Um, can we find you on Twitter and social media and so on? Yes. Yes, okay. so you can find me at Dr. Emily Grossman on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and you can find me through my website, which is emilygrossman.co.uk. Um, and hopefully you'll be hearing a little bit more about this book as well in the coming months, um, because um, I've just it's just been shortlisted for a really cool primary school book. Award. Yes, congratulations on the Teach Primary uh, shortlist. Uh, and fingers crossed, you clink the deal we'll all be rooting for you thank you so much for joining me today make sure you all follow her on social media and get the book but for now from me and i'm on emily... instagram as well at dr oh. I, i'm on instagram uh, i think it's at dr emily grossman one or something like that <laughs> we forget uh, they can find me <laughs> self followed on all forms of social media um but for now it's goodbye from the both of us catch no, you next time to talk to you connie lovely to speak to you see you guys bye